Hi everybody, welcome to my channel. My name is Margaret Ellis Raymond and I'm an author and I was born with tricuspid atresia. This series of videos is to thank all mothers of CHD children. The human side of congenital heart conditions is often buried by the medical. I hope this series of videos brings comfort and answers. If you enjoy, please subscribe as that helps me reach more people who might benefit from this content. Happy Mother's Day. So you found out that I was going to be born with tricuspid atresia before I was born. Well, we didn't know it was going to be tricuspid atresia. They knew there was a major heart abnormality, but oh. they couldn't tell us exactly what it was. Okay, and that's... Until you were born, which was really scary because you knew there was going to be something and they said it could be extensive, it could... I mean, they knew it wasn't going to be mild, but it was going to be moderate, but they had all these different ideas of what it might be and they didn't know exactly. Oh, I thought you said that they, when they did, like, the ultrasound, they kind of had an idea of what I had. Uh, they had, they, they had some idea, but they weren't exactly sure. They, they started out with several different possibilities, but mm -hmm. then I think as we kept going for more ultrasounds, it became more clear, you know? Oh, and okay. It, and as the weeks went on, because that was six weeks, you know, you were due to be born in six weeks. So it was a month and a half that we knew. Oh, I thought yeah. you knew sooner. It was uh -oh. just a month and a half? Yeah, before you were born, yeah. Oh, wow. So yeah. you went in for like a normal ultrasound and then... Well, I had gone to my doctor and she said that... Um, I hadn't gained, you know, I wasn't bigger than the last time, which she mm -hmm. said is a little unusual that late in the pregnancy. So she says I was a little smaller. And then she mm. did this testing and she said, you know, there wasn't as much amniotic fluid, you know, as there should be at this point. Oh. Yeah. And I didn't know what that meant. She goes, oh, sometimes it's nothing, you know, so I'm hoping it was, you know, I was hoping it was nothing. Mm. And um, then she said, well, I'll have you go for an ultrasound. And so that's when we went for the ultrasound and they did everything and everything looked great. And... The technician just said, look, we're going to take one quick look at the heart, and then, you know, we'll let you go. Everything looks fine. Yeah. So she did this quick look at the heart, which turned into a longer look, and then she didn't say anything, and then she says, I'll be right back. And she put a tissue box next to me and then left the room. And I thought, okay, this can't be good. You know, so then she came in with another doctor, and that's when we knew something was really up. What was yeah. going through your mind at that point? Uh... I couldn't even begin to wonder, you know, I, I just didn't, she wasn't saying anything, she didn't say anything, so you don't know, you don't want to read into it, you know. The other doctor came in, or technician came in and said, well, we're seeing a, a heart defect and, you know, you'll have to go see another doctor, high, high, high risk pregnancy specialist, so that's when we went out to see another doctor later in the day, and uh, we were just freaked out. We went to see the specialist that afternoon, and... Oh, wow, that's a quick turnaround. Oh, yeah, they, they got us right in. That I think it was later that afternoon, and um, he was good. Before he even started with anything, he said, I know one of the first questions you're going to ask me is, you know, what, what could I have done to prevent this? And he said, don't even go there. You know, don't even go there, because some people do everything, quote, right, in the pregnancy and have a child with a problem and others he says I've seen women who have been you know drug users and what I have normal kids you know tech you know as normal as can be you know and he said there's nothing you know it's congenital when he said it was a congenital heart defect I immediately thought genetic you know like it was some genetic mutation or problem and he said congenital just means present at birth so Anything can be present at birth. It doesn't mean that there's a genetic predisposition or anything. So, so that was good to know. So then you had that appointment that afternoon, yeah. and he told you all of that information, and then you went home, yeah. and now you're confronted with less than a month to basically prepare. Right. What did well, you... Well, there's nothing you can really prepare. I mean, the first thing, when we left there, he did say that heart abnormalities of, of that nature, he says, a lot of times are accompanied with Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to know, you know, my doctor wanted to know if we wanted an amniocentesis to find out if there was Downs. And I figured, why not? I mean, you know, that way to be ready ahead of time, to mm -hmm. me, was better than not knowing, you know, kind of get over the, the, I don't know. Shock? Yeah, the shock, but the, you know, the, 
you just want to be ready. You want to ha have time to get used to the idea even before a baby's born, then you, you kind of get your mind wrapped around it, you know, what to expect. Mm -hmm. Um, so we did have the amnios amniocentesis done, not that afternoon, obviously. Right. I mean, no. that had happened a while later, but we got the results really quick, and mm. it was, there was no Down syndrome, so that was good, you know. Um, but, you know, you're still going to deal with whatever the heart uh, defect was, you know. Right. Uh, but then, you know, as, as it got closer to you, to delivery, um, they were able to see it more clearly, mm. and they were pretty much at that point said it was looked like tricuspid atresia, and that... There's a surgery for that, and there's a three-part surgery, and they they explain the whole thing mm. um, at that point. But I think they had to wait till they could get really good um, ultrasounds, you know, and really see. It's like clearer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think as you get bigger too, as you get old, you know, the baby gets bigger, you can see right. better. Anyway, so they were able to do that, and they they were really right on the money. I mean, they they yeah. knew exactly what it was, and yeah, yeah. they said what to expect. You know, mm -hmm. uh, oh, one of the things that the uh, the specialist told me, which I thought was really helpful, was he said, don't go home and Google any of this. Mm. <laughs> he said, don't look it up because every child with a heart defect or congenital heart defect is going to be different. Some have very mild, some have very severe, even some that have severe do really well, some that have mild, it gets worse. I mean, you just don't know. You don't know. And he said, until they're born and we can really work you know, tell you clearly, he says, you're just going to go scare yourself for nothing. And he right. was right. I, I actually did go and Google some things and then thought, oh, <laughs> not good. <laughs> and that was even in 1994 right. when the internet was still getting on its feet and they might not have yeah. the most accurate. Right. They accurate... didn't have much information as yeah. much as, you know, right. they do now. So, And so that was the only time that you went and you looked, even as I grew up. And yeah, I didn't bother anymore. I mean, it's really good to to deal with what is real. Mm. And what was real was they knew your case, they followed you, they, they knew your history, they knew, you know, it was just not helpful to go search for stuff that right. may never happen, you know. What would you say to people who find out they have a, a child who's going to have this diagnosis, but they don't really trust their doctor's in that capacity well then you have a I think an issue you really should trust the doctors you know or and I say trust we had doctors that that worked with you after you were born that didn't have great bedside manner there was one in particular a cardiologist mm -hmm. who was just very um, blunt and matter-of-fact about mm -hmm. everything and it wasn't very sympathetic um, not that I wanted big sympathy but I mean you can there's a way to phrase something you don't right. say we can do this, this, and this, and that. there's always the risk of death, you know. I mean, mm. that was so, it was harsh to hear that, and that was hard. Um, but I knew he was excellent at what he did. He knew his stuff. Mm. So you kind of have to deal with that. But right. there were some that really had a great way of explaining things. And if you're not part of the care team, if there's someone in the care team that is not as clear as others, we asked for someone that could be the point person to come and tell us, kind of interpret for us, if you mm. will, which helped a lot because it, it took out the confusion because some would say things one way and then the other doctor would say something and it, they were saying the same thing, but they said it differently and mm. you took it differently. So we found it helpful to, we asked for having just one doctor be the explainer, if you will. <laughs> right. You know? Gotcha. So huh. that helped. Let's say you were having, not that you would, but a child now, mm -hmm. and you find out that they have a condition like this, would you feel more comfortable with the internet as it is now to reach out a little bit more and find... Um, that's not my nature to okay. do that. Um, because I really think that, again, with a health condition, unless it's something that's really well established, mm -hmm you don't know what you're dealing with really mm -hmm. and it's taken out of context because sometimes in support groups you have people who are at different levels at different times right you know and people who have other conditions on top of the heart condition you know or on top of because when right. we took extra you, defects right or exactly and and you had certain defects you had right you know, the tricuspid atresia, and you had a ventral septal defect, I think. An and ASD just, and a VSD. Right. Yeah. But 
there are some kids who have that, plus they have transposition of arteries, they have other things. Right. So yes, they have what you have, but then they have these other add-ons, or people have what you have, but they didn't have certain other things. So it's not apples and apples. Hmm. It never really is. So it's hard to, I think after, as you grew up and got older, and you know, a support group would have been helpful to some degree in that you have someone to talk to about it. Um, like me as the patient, right? Not you as the mother. Well, no, I mean other mothers to talk to about mm-hmm. it, you know, and see how, how. But again, you always wade into that comparison water, which isn't really good either, because there are mm-hmm. always going to be some that are do a little better, or a little worse, than, you know. So right. it's it's kind of hard. You almost have to go to those groups and anticipate, like I'm just here to see what someone else's life is like, mm-hmm. and not actually take it as. Oh, that's going to be me in five years. You know? Well, you just yeah, you just don't know, and none of us know. Even even right. people who you know have a child without a heart defect, right. you don't know. All of a sudden, something you know they they bruise easily, and then they do further testing, and oh, they've got this thing going on. You right. Know? So no know. one knows. I mean, life is is a gamble all the mm. way. How did you cope with the information before I was born? What did you do? What kind of tactics kind of helped you be less anxious right before um, you had me yeah it, it definitely you have to give yourself a period of time to just be shocked about it and freak a little bit about it you know mm. I mean you, you have Natural. to get that out you know you, you just have to I mean we you cried a lot and you know got all kind of worried but then after you just have to stop yourself and say okay it's not doing any good and it's going to happen regardless and we got to get it together and figure this out, you know? So you just take a day at a time, you know? I mean, there really isn't any figuring it out. I mean, the doctors explained every time, every time I had an appointment, I asked more questions, things would come to me. I would take notes and, Mm -hmm. you know, feel more empowered by getting the information and knowing what could, you know, could happen and not. And, you know, but no, I mean, you just, you just have to go through it and just say, you have to trust, you know, and say it's okay. I was relieved when the doctors talked about the surgeries, and I asked, okay, so I'm assuming we'll have to go down to Boston for that. And they said, no, we have it right here. So yeah, that, that was, was nice. that was reassuring because I thought, well, then that must mean, in a way, they've seen this before. And they said, mm-hmm. oh, absolutely, we've done these surgeries before. So it wasn't a condition that they were like, oh, only one in, you know, uh, 200,000 people have this and it's so rare that you have to fly up to California to have the surgery you know mm. it wasn't like that you know so that kind of makes you feel better knowing that it is out there and people you're not alone in this and it's not so rare that nothing can be done you know right there's kind of like a prognosis and they know right. what surgeries need to happen depending on what right what heart defects you have yeah. and you, then you're just so grateful that you you live in this time period because, oh gosh yeah you know you think of it 40 50 years ago i wouldn't be here 60 years ago these babies died after birth i mean right born suddenly blue. because that what can they do they couldn't operate on a heart they told us an, a newborn's heart is the size of a walnut a walnut i mm. mean imagine doing surgery on that you don't even have the tools I mean, just getting a dental filling back when I was a little kid, they used like a major drill bit, you know, (laughs) half your tooth was gone. Now they do it so precise that you don't even know, you know. So everything's improved, and so that's that's better. Can you tell me my birth story? Yeah, it was was stressful for sure. Um, And really, when I had your sister... I didn't, you know, this was my first child, and I didn't know what to expect, so I thought, okay, this feels a little uncomfortable, and then she was born, you know? So, (laughs) I mean, I had gotten all the way to the end thinking it was going to get much worse, and I was already at the end. You just have a really high pain tolerance. I think so. I don't know. (laughs) I I got to the hospital, and the doctor says, oh, you're eight and a half centimeters dilated, and I was like, okay. And she says, listen, tense the birth. Remember that? And I thought, no. And then she said talked about the Lamaze film and I said oh the part where the woman's screaming and she wants drugs she goes that's about the part but you can't have any because you're too far along you know and it wasn't bad you know everything went well and it was fast and that was the end but when I had you I knew there was going to be a problem Mm -hmm. with you after birth and they were going to have to do surgeries and all of this so I almost psychologically didn't want to have it you know didn't want to have you I mean I did but like my body was saying no no 
you know. So my doctor was saying, oh, I think we will probably want to induce you. We'll give you some Pitocin, which was something a friend of mine had had and said, you want to die because she thought it was horrible having that because it was gave her such pain. Um, I don't know. It might not have been bad if they did it for me, but they didn't because when she said that, it scared me so much. I thought, okay, I, I got to let go here. And, you know, so then everything progressed normally, and, right. you know. But, and yeah, it's funny psychologically what it can do to you, the fear. You yeah. just clamp right down and like, okay, I'm not going to have it. Right, right. <laughs> like that's an option, you know. But Right. Now, so then you ended up, so, so I was born and then... In all those birthing videos, you know, they show the mom having the baby and the the doctor or the midwife mm-hmm. give the mother the baby, like, right off the bat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What, that didn't happen for no, you? No, no. They took you right away. They they weighed you and they brought you in the little isolate thing and they got you all hooked up to the things right away, which is the right move. You know, that's the right thing to do. But I think they brought you over for a second or two, you know, mm-hmm. but it was quick and you were quite bluish I mean you were very you know your coloring wasn't right you could tell right away I mean it wasn't horrible but I mean it was you could see you know and Mm. but they said you know we're sorry we have to do this and we were like no no do what you have to do you know and they they did and got you all hooked up and everything and it was weird it was definitely weird and part of you feels kind of angry that this is happening you Mm. know because it doesn't feel fair but I mean what is fair right if it didn't happen to us it would have happened to someone else because it does happen to people you know so so they they wheeled me off they wheeled you off and then where did you and dad what did you guys do well no you go back to your room and you recover you know but they they discharge me like the next day because they don't keep you in the hospital long like they used to in the 50s where you have a week's stay you know right right (laughs) the maternity ward was like a hotel no um and you went home without me i did yeah we had to yeah and that was weird. That was just felt really, really bizarre. It just felt really wrong, you know. But you, it's right, you know. So then you had the surgery three days later. You were, um, well, tell me um, when, so, so you came home without me, and then you're, you almost like settled back in to just having you know, my older sister at home and... Well, you don't really, there's no real time to settle back and you're still sort of in shock and you feel, you know, you, I mean, you've just had a baby, so you're like, you know. Well, it was almost like, it's almost like you are afraid to go back. Right. Because Once it's they discharge kind of a you. scary place. You know, I mean, it mm. isn't, but your baby is there and it's all hooked up to tubes and then they're going to do a surgery. And it was just freaky. It was like, if I stayed away, maybe that wasn't really happening. Right. Which is stupid, right? But your mind plays really bad yeah. tricks on you, you know, and you just, you almost want to not go back because it's too scary. Mm. But of course, yeah, I mean, you go right back and you go and, you know. You face things that um, you'd rather not, but you feel better when you do it because it's less scary. Yeah. It, your imagination's not taking over. You're actually dealing with reality. Right. You know, so that worked. So. And so Dad and you went, went back to the hospital, mm-hmm. and then they did the surgery. Yeah. What was that like? Um, it was actually really fast. I was really mm-hmm. surprised. It wasn't... It didn't, wasn't very long. The first one? The first, very first one. I can't remember what that one was called. That was the little, through the ribs, you know, the little... Uh, Blaylock. Was it? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So that didn't take very long. And yeah, we met the surgeon after and he said everything went great. And yeah, it, it did. So you, yeah. And, and then did you get to take me home after that one? Oh, yeah. I mean, I can't remember how many days. They, they you know, wait for you to recover and... Yeah, but yeah, we brought you home, and and the big thing was whether you would you would want to nurse or eat, you know, if your appetite mm. would come right back, and it did, and you were good, so yeah, yeah, and then it was good. You had me at home for how much longer until the next surgery? It was six months. You had the next surgery at six months. That was okay. the the first open heart surgery at six months, and which was that? is yeah. really terrifying. That one because was because the the first surgery that Blaylock won, you did not have to be on a heart lung bypass and all of this kind of thing, whereas the second surgery that was open heart surgery you know right. and it's tough enough when you the know when, shunt. right when you have a uh, when you have a uh, an adult who goes and has open heart surgery it's terrifying but a six-month-old baby right. I mean you were just this little tiny thing and it was this big 
stretcher thing and and then the nurse, you know, you know, the surgery was was going on, and she came out and said, "Okay, well, we've stopped her heart now, and she's we're on the bypass machine." And I mean, that's terrifying. Mm. Yeah, but they it went really super well, and everything. Yeah, it and went there was really well. Complications after the first one, right? No, the second one. Oh, it was the second one. So that the space between the first and the second, or the first and the third surgery, right, was longer. Right. Right. You had the first uh, open heart surgery at six months, and then the last one was at three and a half years old. Right. <clears throat> so that was a lot of time that went by. And it was so, it was easy to forget you even had a heart issue because you didn't show any signs of it. You were running around like a normal kid. You were goofy, silly, having a good time and right. playing. And I mean, there, there was no, you had no sign of it whatsoever right, except for the scar you know right. other than that no one would have known you know but then you got to be three and a half and I could tell your you know at that point I wondered if we were getting close to the time where they would do really? another one yeah not the way you were behaving or anything but every time we'd go to the doctor they would oh. be like mm, you know we're getting close and I, I couldn't believe it I thought again three and a half years old we're going to do this again you know but that was the fine I knew that was the last one that you would, would hope, fine. Yeah. No, that no, that was it. They for, said that for me, surgically yeah. there was nothing more they could do after that third surgery. They said that that was going to be all they could do, and they said that would make it fine. You know, I mean, that would that's that's the procedure they go through with the three. Yeah. And so then you came back at three, oh, three and, three and, and a half? half, three and a half. Yeah. Brought me back. Yeah. And what was my reaction? Because now I'm I'm old enough to kind of have an idea something's going to happen. Right, right. Well, you kept saying um, that they were going to f- they were going to fix your, your your and you would rub your scar. You said they would take this away. You thought they were going to take your scar away. You thought that's what no. it was about, you know. And so we didn't, you know, we didn't really talk much about it cuz we didn't want we told you, you were, we were going to go there and the doctors were going to, you know, take care of you and we didn't really describe much cuz at three and a half, I mean, you know, you can't really get into major description, I wouldn't think. We didn't do it. Right. So we just explained it. They give you a little booklet to talk about it, and there was this little right. little bear with a zipper or something. Oh. So, yeah, there was a little That's kind cool. of cartoon story they tell. Hmm. But I don't know if you got that at three and a half, really. But, but you went in, and yeah. yeah. And so then you remember watching them wheel me away. For the third one. Yeah. And was that the time that you just kind of like sat and you were just like, oh, God. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, every time they well, do Well, every it, time, yeah. You know, it's terrifying. But but knowing that that would be hopefully the last one. I mean, that's what they said. It's a three-part right. surgery. Right. Birth and then six months and three. Roughly and I didn't that. have many complications. So it was just the three. Other right. people might have more surgeries for Probably. different things. Yeah, could but, be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but they said, no, this would do it, you know, so. And so then yeah. I come out of the surgery, and it yeah. was, um, everything seems to be going well, and I have drainage tubes. Yeah, yeah, they told us that the the lungs would weep, the plural effusions, I think they called mm-hmm. it, effusions, whatever. And you did, you drained a lot, um, but it wasn't slowing down after several days, and they thought that was really weird. Mm-hmm. Um, and they did things to try to change that but it just wasn't you would just kept draining a mm. lot and uh, which is to drain is normal but for that long is not so and now then, did they ever figure out why I was draining no, so much no they said some people do some people take oh. a long time but this was really abnormally long mm. for kids especially um and uh so it kept, you know kept happening kept happening so then finally you know it slowed down some mm. which we were on the a good path and then they l- had had us leave the special care unit, and you went mm. into a regular room, which meant obviously you were doing better. Mm. But it scared me because I like the special care unit because the the, the least little thing that happens, someone is right there because it's critical care, um, and it kind of calmed me down because I thought you know all these tubes and wires and bells and all this stuff, but. Um, they took you off a lot of the machines, which was good, and then we went to this the regular room, uh, pediatric room. Still draining. Still draining, not as much. Um, 
and you were there for it was a couple days and then the drainage almost stopped I mean it really went down to nuts so we were pretty excited because we thought hey this is excellent and um you were really acting weird that night you seemed more tired than usual your dad and I would take turns staying with you in the room and it was my night to stay with you that night and you just were flopping around a lot you seemed uncomfortable and uh, I kept telling the nurse "Eh, it seems uncomfortable and she kept saying well you know we're on some medications this isn't her normal routine and all that and she's been through a lot and it's true you know but you kept flopping around and I thought it's still not right so I went and I I kept going out to the the doctor and the nurse you know in the hallway and saying this isn't right so finally they did a chest Mm x-ray and um, they came back and they said no there's nothing going on I said but it's still not right because you just were not you were the kid that if someone sneezed in the hallway, you'd wake up. And right. you were just kind of groggy and just out of it. And I thought, this isn't right. This isn't mm-hmm. right. And so the nurse came in. Well, at that point, you know, you settled down for a while. I fell asleep. And then in the morning when the nurse came in, um, she could tell right away. And she got a doctor to come in. And, and uh, he explained that one of the drainage tubes had blocked and you basically were in congestive heart failure. Your, your, oh your um, sac, the pericardium was filling and, and your heart wasn't beating mm. as strong as it should be. And he said, it's not, it hasn't gone really, really bad, but he said, we got to get this drainage out now, right. you know. So they wheeled you off and I thought, oh my God, you know, I mean, right. you know, you're just not expecting this, you know, because right. we were so close and you were doing better. And right. Like so I wasn't it, supposed to drain for that long. Exactly, like, exactly. And <laughs> who, would have, kid. who would have thought after all that draining that a tube would have been pl- blocking anything because right. you figure there's nothing left to drain. So there's right. no block, you know. Right. So I can see where no one really was alarmed about that. I wasn't. I didn't think of that. And they but, didn't think of that. But you're like, uh, she's not acting like herself I at know. all. <laughs> exactly. And that's where you have to really advocate. Yeah. You you know your child more than anyone else. And if they're not, if this isn't mm. right, you've got to just keep mm. pounding and saying, this isn't right. And yell and scream and make a scene if you have to. <laughs> right. I didn't do that because... It was convincing when they said, well, she's on a lot of medications, and right. she's probably just sick and tired. Of, and it's true, but there was still something. There yeah. was still something, you know. Um, so anyway, um, they did take you to the procedure room, whatever. They took the drainage out, everything, and you came out of it fine. Everything was looked okay. And um, your dad came and stayed with you, and I went home just to get a break. Mm. And when I came back a couple hours later, um, he said you had been taken to another procedure room because you had had a stroke, and I thought I was going to drop dead right on the floor at that mm. time. I couldn't believe it. I, I mean, it was going from not so great to worse all the time, and right. it just freaked me right out. Um, and what was the the visual cues? You said Dad explained it to you later. Yeah, like you were. He says you were twitching all over, which is not a normal sign of a stroke. Uh, right. Well, it was almost like a little epileptic. Kind of see, and and actually, when the um, pediatric neurologist came, he did on the the chart he put down pediatric epilepsy. epilepsy. You don't huh. have epilepsy, but it was like an epileptic kind of. You you yeah. had this shaking and twitching, and um, the day that day that you had the stroke, I saw them all. You know, we were all around your bed. You know, and it was all the cardiology team was around there. And I could just look, I looked at all their faces and I thought, oh my word, they, they, they've never seen anything like, you know, they've never seen this before. Mm-hmm. And it just, that scared me because you want right. them to say, no, no, we've seen this and we know it comes out good, you know. Right. Um, but they couldn't say that. And mm-hmm. I thought, I don't know, now I, I just I, I just put it in someone else's hands. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm done now. I mean, I've done everything. They've done everything they can do. Everyone's done everything they can do. You just have to trust and say, well, yeah. you know, whatever. And it all worked out, you know. But So then he, after, you know, they, they did the drainage and all of that and they gave you whatever medication they do, um, he said, well, you were going to sleep for quite a while. Mm-hmm. And then when you came out of it, that's when we would really learn if there would be, have been any damage from right. the stroke. So he and explained s- it. He said it was uh, because the heart was in, in the fluid you know it wasn't beating properly he said once that fluid went away and it started beating stronger he said microscopic 
platelets of the blood clumped together. Because it hadn't been pumping. Right. And then once it got released and it started pumping hard, it just shot those little platelets all over over the place. So he said, on your brain, you could see on the brain brain scan, because they did a CT CT scan or... I guess. Brain. I guess it would be CT. And they said you could see tiny little white dots, and those were the clots. Hmm. But he said they were not. Fortunately, they were very lightly scattered. None, none were in a big grouping of clump. <clears throat> so he didn't think there was going to be much damage, if any, which was really a relief. But again, hmm. we didn't know until I woke you up. woke up. And how did how did that whole process happen? Well, how did I wake up? It was in, it was about I don't know two or three in the morning, and you had been kind of sedated, if you will, mm-hmm. the whole time, and we were just because they did the MRI, they had to put me under right. for that, well, the, right. whatever the scan was, yeah, or, yeah, CT, I'm not sure, yeah, I can't remember what it was called, but, um, and uh, so your dad and I were sitting there. It was like two or three in the morning. We we're half asleep, but we're sitting by your bed, you know, waiting for you to wake up, you know, and um, we had brought in the uh, <laughs> videotape of. Um, VHS. VHS, yeah, video, <laughs> literal, back in yeah. 94, well, four, it's 97, yeah. videotape of um, uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. That was your favorite. Oh, we played that probably in 900 times while we were there. We were there about a month and a half in the hospital. Yeah, For the third one. For the third one, yeah. And um, so finally, I don't know, three in the morning or so, you just opened your eyes and you looked over at me and you looked over at your dad and you said, Mom, Dad, well, let's watch the video or I don't know what you said but you said something that just got us laughing because you right. you just woke right up like it was nothing and started right. talking you know <laughs> so that was great so then of course the neurologist came you know a few hours later checked you out and mm. said that he thought if anything it would probably be maybe some mild peripheral vision problems and but, I don't have that but you don't have that but we didn't know then you know but he right. said the one thing when something like this happens to a young person a really young person like yourself um, he said that the body and the brain is unbelievably plastic mm-hmm. and can almost heal itself. Whereas, Depending on how severe something is. Oh, yeah. absolutely. I mean, yeah. if it was a massive, massive, that, you know. But on the mild side, they said he said something like this happening to an adult, there would be more noticeable damage. But with oh. the child, it's almost like you just kind of have a way of regenerating. Right, it's plasticity it's, of the brain. Yeah. yeah. So he was he was pretty good about his explanation with that, you know. So that's kind of how that happened. And then from then on, that there was no drainage anymore. There was no problem. And then you, they took out the tubes. Yeah, and, and you you done. came back totally to yourself. You had that energy that you know it was almost it was weird. Yeah. You know, it was it was scary when they took the tubes out because I kept thinking, oh God, leave those in all the time because we, <laughs> they, you know there was always something. But they were assured that mm. they were completely cleared and mm. there was no drain. They kept, you know, we stayed in a, a few, you know, quite a bit longer after that just to make sure. Right. And uh, they were sure, and yeah. And then the walk out of the hospital oh, was yeah. not quite a walk, right? No, no, we had to <clears throat> we had to bring you in a little. Uh, well, we had to carry you, I think, at some point because you, you had your muscles had kind of atrophied to some degree, you know, like you hadn't been walking or using them and walking around or doing anything because mm. you were hooked up to all those tubes. So you really had a hard time. You couldn't really yeah. walk well. So they, after we were discharged, we had a care manager who said, we're going to have um, physical therapy come to the house and help you. And, you know, within no time, we, we were discharged. You were discharged, let's see, second week in October, I think. And... Um, by Halloween, we were out trick or treating. He wanted you wanted to go in the worst way, and you yeah. were fully walking, totally fine. You went out trick or treating, and um, what what was the costume you made me again? Ah, <laughs> you and your sister. I think that was the costume where you were ice cream cones. <laughs> what did you make it out of again? Uh, that egg crate material, you know, <laughs> that they use in beds, the foam beds. So I had the vests with these things and then you had like like cotton stuff on your head it was kind of funny and those cotton things on your head you didn't like that so you guys you and your sister just walked around with the little the little waffle vests on and we went to this house and this man opened the door and said oh lovely little cannolis <laughs> he had no idea what you guys were we left the ice cream heads home and you just went in your cannoli vests <laughs> Oh, gosh, I love it. So when you started seeing the cardiologist and you were around, I mean, you always saw a cardiologist, but um, 
when you're about nine or ten years old, um, he said to you, you really have, you own this condition. This is yours and you own it and you can advocate for yourself. So in other words, what he meant by that is particularly in school settings where mm -hmm. your parents aren't going to be around to advocate for you, you have to advocate for yourself. And he said, I know in schools it's a really big thing of, you know, you have to do, you know, exercise in gym class and they'll make you run the track and everything you have to say to them, I'll do my best, but I cannot do long distance running because I have this heart condition and explain it and, but yeah. own it, not feel pressured to compete with other kids or be like them because he goes, you can't be because you're, you're just, your heart pumps very well, but the blood returning to your lungs, it doesn't pick up the oxygen as fast. So you're going to run into oxygen depletion if you force the system too hard. Hmm. And so he explained it in a really good way, and I think you, you understood it. And, yeah. and you, you did advocate for yourself a lot after that. But it's hard because you don't want to distinguish yourself from other kids. You want to be right. like everyone else and want to do everything they can do. But the fact is there are some kids who physically can't do it because they have a condition. There are other kids who can't do it because they're not athletic, mm -hmm. others who just don't have stamina, others who, you know, others who are going to be Olympic marathon runners, you know, I mean, you know, you don't know. Mm -hmm. So he said, just do what you can and, uh, you know, stay healthy. He definitely advocated you getting exercise, but right. he said you can't do certain things like scuba diving, anything pressure on the lungs or right. any kind of thing with oxygen. Um, you know, like marathon running is out, um, right. long distance biking is out, you know, things that are really, you're not going to have time to recuperate. You right. have to have a sport or something that is going to allow for mm. that recovery, short bursts rather than the long endurance, you know. Right. And then I found fencing. There you go. Da da da. <laughs> Different video coming later. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, well, cool. Yeah. Well, it's been very nice chatting with everyone. <laughs> with everyone. <laughs> with everyone out there in Radio Land. <laughs> in, in YouTube Land. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All you YouTubers. <laughs> <laughs> you were in radio, right? Oh, don't go there. <laughs> Back in I the guess, dark ages. I guess that's the end of this interview. <laughs>